Hey everybody, this is Tim Anderson. I'm the program coordinator for the Florida Film Festival. And I wanna thank you guys so much for having just enjoyed uh, Sunspots, New Visions of the Avant-Garde. Uh, and this is our Q&A with the filmmakers. If you are somehow watching this before you watch the movies, you are doing it wrong and uh, go stop immediately, go back, watch the movies, and then jump in here and listen to the five filmmakers that we've got that have come in to talk a little bit about the projects um, that we have. So uh, I'm gonna start with, and, uh, with Helena. Um, hi, welcome. Hi, hi Tim. Good to see you. So to, what, what movie was yours? Um, I, I'm Helena Klima, I'm the filmmaker of Lucid Dreams. And uh, Lucid Dreams is an experimental film because it's, uh, it's, it's only text, it's te entirely text. And it's inspired by my friends and peers. And it started with my own experience during the beginning of the pandemic. And then we shared thoughts and we were trying to connect and we were trying to find new ways to connect. And then I kind of wrote this script like, on bright backdrop scrolling yeah. text piece. Awesome. Well, we're going to get into that more a little bit when I come around with some questions, but um, I would love to have uh, Ben introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Ben Young. I'm the uh, director of uh, William Jefferson William Jefferson Wilderness. Um, do you want me to talk about how, why, or did we save that for later? Yeah, yeah. We'll sorry. talk about, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I'm fucking with the protocol already, sorry. <laughs> This is what I like about Zoom. Somebody asked the other day, he's like, do you want to talk about it? And then I'll talk about it. Or do we just talk over each other? And I was like, I think you're required to only talk over each other. On Zoom. <laughs> this is not live radio. We do not have this down where there's a point and you go and I go. So um, uh, let me bring it to, to Sean. Hi, Sean. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Shan Wu. Uh, my film is called Wild Grass, and it's a story about a Taiwanese woman coming to America and experiencing like language barrier and like uh, like changing of her self identity and looking back to her memories and all of that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm really glad that you got a chance to join us. I have a million questions about the movie. Uh, Edgar, welcome. Cool. Still muted. There you go. Sorry, I think you froze on my screen. So oh, I'm... sorry, my internet's terrible too. Yeah. Um, but I'll just go on like you just introduced me. Hey. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Edgar. Uh, my film is called Ventana, and it's a film that uh, I made last summer during quarantine when I came across a picture of uh, my childhood's living room window back in Venezuela. And so it's about the memories that it triggered. Awesome, well, thank you. This is a little bit of a homecoming screening for you as well, so I'm excited about that. So. Yeah, I'm a UCF alum. And Jordan, welcome. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me. I made the film Mountain <laughs> Uh, um, uh, yeah, and it's about a candle. <laughs> I didn't, I, I've literally, first, I'm not going indoors anymore. So like, I won't go to a mall, but I, I'm actually shocked to discover that this is even a section of Yankee <laughs> Candle <laughs> and that this is an actual set. I'm like a little shocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to get into that pretty soon, <laughs> but I, it literally had me running to Google. <laughs> um, uh, Helena, let, let's start with you uh, around it. Just a quick question. This is kind of nice because you were in the festival last year and we didn't get a chance to talk. Um, and your style is completely unique to anything else that I've ever seen in submissions over the last four years that we've been doing this program. Um, and this is even a departure from last year. For those of you who didn't see the purple video, all of the all of the dialogue that was scrolling by was erasing itself uh, as you were trying to read it. So it forced you to be an active participant in the movie. So this one is a little 
well, easier, I think, on the audience to handle. But obviously, it's a profoundly interesting quarantine film, which is why we opted to start the program with it. So, you know, I'd love to know, first, I want to know how you developed your style. Uh, and then, you know, why, why the, why the pandemic subject, which just seems a little obvious, but you know. Oh, you're still on mute. <laughs> That's a good question. I, um, I, how did I start? I, I always loved writing and I, at some point, I also love movement. So I kind of, and I love film and I, maybe I even didn't have back then when I started the, the equipment to do something else. So I kind of, um, it kind of came together and I, I, I love the hypnotizing, mesmerizing moment about it because yeah. it's, it's, a, it's the text is scrolling and I, I hope that it does like pull the audience in. It does pull me in. If I read yeah. text which is moving, I gotta follow. And um, for the pandemic, yeah, of course, we were all at home kind of stuck. So it totally made sense to make another text piece, just the laptop and myself yeah. and the, just, yeah. Yeah, the other interesting thing about this is we did a live Q&A during Sunspots last year, which is where the purple video played. And we have one filmmaker came in because it was August and we had a live screening and we were a little bit insane to do that. But, um, and one of the filmmakers just happened to be, even though he actually had not made the film when he was living in Orlando, he had actually just moved to Orlando. So he came in, he did his Q&A. And then we asked the audience to ask questions, which we assumed would all be directed to the filmmaker who came, but all of them asked me questions about the purple video. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. What did everyone ask? I'm they were just like, uh, it was a lot of discussion about, because obviously the film is very much about, um, it's, you know, it's timely, it's about sexual assault. It's, you know, about, yeah. you know, yeah. and so, and I was like, I have no ability to answer any of your questions about this movie, nor do I feel that I should ever answer any of the intent questions of this film. <laughs> but I love that, that's so great. Yeah. They're very engaged. So I like a little anecdote for this. Um, Shan, <laughs> since, since Helena opens the program, you close the program. And this is a film that was hotly debated amongst the competition narrative program uh, for the festival, as well as being ultimately ported over to the Sunspots programmers. Um, and it, again, it represents essentially an, a style of experimental animation that I've not really come across before. And, and we like to try to celebrate that in this program, but this is like, re it's like taking the diary film and transforming it to almost a new medium. So I'm also kind of interested in the idea of like why, the story clearly seems very personal and you can touch on that if you'd like, but I also wanna know just a little bit about kind of coming to your decision to tell the story in the manner that you did. Cool, thanks for the question. So this is very personal. This is like, uh, so I started this writing the script uh, from my diary. So I, I was taking a class called Dangerous Filmmaking and it's like, it wanted us to look at ourselves, like things that we normally wouldn't want to touch. So I uh, gather all of my diary and some emotion that I, I feel really strong that that just linger with me. So, and I use that as a material to, to make a, a, like make a script. And I, first I wanted to be very narrative and that's how I, like, I know there, there'll be a lot of changes when I, when I do editing, because I feel like I, I'm more um, uh, comfortable just working with myself instead of like going out and shooting. And uh, so I, I wrote the script and then Film the film everything, and then I realized I wanted to add a lot of things in it, like add the writing. The writing come yeah. very late, and the editing and also the photography came pretty late. So I it was it was it looks like a very abstract narrative piece at, at first, and then it took me like uh, a year and a half to just editing and add things in and try different um, techniques and 
things that I I feel like it's it it might be working. So it just like take its own life and develop itself. And I, I'm just like supporting this this piece coming together. Yeah. I think one of the things that we talked about a lot when we talked about programming it and it wasn't even a question it was sort of like everybody walked in and said well we know what we're closing the program with now we just have to pick some movies to go with it um and then we started to debate you know the merits of what we liked and what we what we loved and what we thought was a unique take on something um but i think the thing that really struck us about the film visually is the use of instead of having narration allowing the audience again to actively participate in reading a film um, as it's happening and the fact that the film kind of almost almost directly works as something that feels immediate but also nostalgic like you watch it and you feel as if it's a memory but it also feels very immediate and very alive right in the moment um, so I think you just did a really spectacular job of running a fairly difficult thread, I think, to actually pull off, so. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I was like working on this past tense and the the current tense because I am writing it in English, but my it's not my native language. So I am like, it was really like am, ambiguous and once, and I have to decide which part I want to be ambiguous, which, which part I want to be very obvious and uh, that, that people people know that what what uh, they are talking about. And I also want to play with things that are happening in front of you. It's not really what actually happened in the past. So this kind of like uh, the, the line between fiction and uh, nonfiction, like things that really happen and things that are pure narrative, like I just made it up. I want to blur that uh, and using this like tense and like this reveal in the film and hiding hiding from the audience to let them know what really happened. So that, that was the thing that I was playing. Yeah, that's, we loved it. <laughs> it's sort of like so stupid to say, but like we really loved this film. Um, Ben is also another a kind of a technique pioneer for us in that we've never seen anybody do this before. Um, and actually, this was across the board. Um, the program is programmed by three programmers, myself, two incredible women experimental filmmakers. Um, I think I'm frozen or everybody froze. Let's see. Oh, everybody's a little looser now. Okay, so, I think sorry you were frozen for a little bit. I thought so because everybody on my end froze. I don't know why this is doing this today. Yesterday it was perfect. But Ben, uh, what I was saying was that um, this program is put together by myself and two incredible female experimental filmmakers. Um, and all of us are fairly steeped in experimental film history. I just never personally worked in it. I My background was in fine art, so I painted. Um, but we've never seen it done. We've never seen anybody splice the movie like that in our in, before. Um, and we were torn a little bit because Bill Clinton as a subject is really interesting, especially all of, of two of us in that group came of age in the Clinton years, we could vote for him. Uh, and he seemed like this incredible option. And then he kind of was a shit show. Um, <laughs> so you know, it's certainly gotten aggressively worse as we've become a little more, you know, sensitive. So why Clinton as the subject? And then also, again, how you came to this style. And I feel like these questions are redundant, but they're ironically very unique to each of your films in a totally different way. Yeah, I, uh, I think it was, um, it, it, it's sort of, because uh, I, I would, as a, like a teenager, I'd been super invested in sort of politics and, you know, as you said, back in those days, it was a very, it, it seemed like a different option, a better option. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we weren't entirely aware of the whole like 26 flights on Jeffrey Epstein's airplane kind of thing. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I'd been unplugged from that whole sort of American political culture war kind of stuff for a long time. And then I just remember when that sort of Jeffrey Epstein news about Clinton came out, I was like, okay, I've got to deal with this. What is, you know, could be because I used to, you know, it was a formative 
part of my experience, I guess, as a kid. And um, it, it, I wanted to avoid, you know, the standard issue like box tick, you know, Monica with the big hair and blah 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 blah, yeah. you know, injury and, and and try and try and explore it in a more uh, maybe more personal but also a less expected way. And that sort of led to, um, you know, perhaps a slightly broader sort of exploration of, you know, the professional classes betrayal of, you know, huge swathes of people in flyover country in America over the past sort of 30, 40 years and. Um, uh, and, and, and the whole sort of, yeah, the, the, the technique and the whole sort of fusion of, of, of sort of nature with uh, sort of sci-fi elements, um, yeah. it, 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 it came from that kernel of, you know, detail about an uncle of mine, you know, sort of, sort of working on, as I said in the film, electronics that beamed his image into space ultimately. Yeah. And it was like, you know, you, you know, trying to sort of embody and replicate that, that process of forgetting. I guess, uh, constructively forgetting. Um, anyway. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. One of the things that I think we brought to it, and maybe it was never the intent, um, and if not, then I hope to give you some insight into audience, is that we also considered kind of what we were calling it the paper shredder technique. Yeah. Um, and it was also this idea of taking an icon and tearing them apart and then piecing them back together incorrectly. Um, as if you'd ever shredded a paper and then tried to reassemble it. Um, you don't, and it's just the idea of the changing dynamic of your relationship to the subject further away from when that subject was originally brought to your attention. So like I said, children of the 90s, children of the 80s who came of age in the 90s and early 90s, very early 90s. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, and then... Uh, you know, I've watched our icons be torn apart and reassembled in different ways, which is really interesting. No, that that was that was definitely part of our um, yeah. The the, the our the, my my editor Theo at points was like, so are we shredding him or is he is yeah. he is he two thousand oneing us? And I was like, trust me, let's just you know just keep it. keep at it. We'll get there. And uh, so yeah, we it, it, yeah it was a bit mental. We did basically break you know after effects but it was you know I love yeah, it. We got there the <laughs> you're not breaking after effects are you really are you really even trying so. <laughs> um well let me move on to edgar um this is the there's two films that we actually have in the festival this year that kind of are like mini homages oh, yeah. um to pete moidrian uh, and your film kind of like, to me, kind of jumps out originally with that idea of the block monitors. Um, and then you tell this very interesting personal story. So um, the story to me is like really what I want to dive into a little bit on this film. Sorry, you were frozen again, so I'm not sure if you're, I, I gather it's about my film. Yes, I'm um, sorry. Uh, I was saying this is, there's actually two films. The other one is playing in international animation that are sort of little, have little homages in them, in our opinion, to, to Pete Moidrian. Um, and they, so I want to talk, you know, the kind of the monitors in yours, but I said the story in yours is so in kind of incredibly like personal. I really want to talk about the story uh, of the film. Uh, because the simplicity of what you're doing in the style allows the the tale to just really be stand at the forefront and allow the audience to just sort of give themselves completely over to it. Yeah. So the I see. Yeah. So their story, um, you know, there's the beginning narration of the of the film in which it basically talks. It, it's more of a description of the. Uh, photograph that we're looking at yeah and it's um kind of a almost like an analysis an analytical description of that in the beginning it begins that way and then from then it um arrives at like the actual uh sense of memory that it triggers right so um there are there's that story of the narration but i think there's also the story like outside of the film of me coming across this picture and experiencing yeah. those memories, right? So that's not as explicitly like narratively told, but it is there uh, as the sort of starting point of the film and the impulse to make the film. Yeah. Um, and so there, in 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 that is sort of the baseline, and um, you 
that beginning narration starts as a description, starts analytical, it starts almost removed, but then uh, as it goes on, the language becomes more personal. Uh, and at a moment it switches uh, language, it switches from English to Spanish. Yeah. And at that point, it is almost like a, a, a way to destabil, uh, like it's a way to break away from the structure that the film had set up up until that point. And it turns into a different structure, one that is much more uh, involved with the emotions of the memories and also with the, um, yeah, I guess it's like, it is the language of the memory, right? Yeah. So I wanted that shift in language to sort of also mirror a shift in point of view, which is instead of looking at the past from the present, it was to look at the present from the past and sort of think of the past as a, as a future of, of a child. Um, in a way to talk about, you know, in an implicit way, the quarantine that we were living yeah. in last year and this instability, I mean, not just the quarantine, but just the, just the overall instability that we felt with the election, with uh, the protests, with everything that was happening over that summer. And just to, I mean, it's, it's obviously not explicitly uh, in the film, but I wanted to um, reflect on it as from the gaze of, uh, of a child imagining the future in a way. Yeah. No, it's, um, we, we were really struck by it. Um, Kate and Eason were huge, huge champions on this movie as well. And, um, and it's doing very well. I mean, you got the world premiered at Berlin. So, uh, you know, that's not too shabby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was pretty surprised about that. Um, not complaining, but I was, no. <laughs> I'm still surprised about it. Yeah. Oh, it's incredible. I think I was like, you know, I remember texted Kate uh, and I said, oh, you're not going to believe this, but it's going to world premiere to Berlin. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, yeah. um, well, Jordan, so and this is not a slight to say that I've seen this technique before, but I've never seen it done this well. <laughs> I've never seen essentially desktop, the desktop experimental film done so effing on point <laughs> like it's perfect it's just the right amount of anarchy um and humor and uh, yeah i just um it was like a no-brainer like i walked away like kind of almost fist pumping after having watched it I mean, where do you walk away from an, an experimental film like you're watching in your screening room like just fired up about how like how hype you are on it like usually i'm more, more introspective but yours was like fuck this is the best movie ever <laughs> so so i we it, early, briefly in the pre-record i mentioned that i had no idea that this is even true like just the base level of the the thesis of the movie just that there even is a man scented candle section of the yankee candle store um and so I guess I don't even know if I want to know the inspiration, but I do want to know how you actually did this technique so much better than everybody else does, which is an unfair question because you haven't seen everybody else do it, but I have. So. Um, wow, thank you for the kind words. Um, I, uh, I mean, the technique itself, it, it was pretty, it, it wasn't, that was, I, I guess maybe on like a technical standpoint, that was maybe like the most difficult part of the film, but it all came together pretty quickly. Um, I uh, like it's, it's pretty different than how I normally work. All my other work that like I spend a lot more time on is a lot more serious and like introspective or like personal. And this is maybe was, like the least that at all. Uh, and I, I, all, all the other films I make tend to take like upwards of like a year and this was done in like a weekend. And I, and I, I always think that's kind of Funny how that works out but um yeah i mean it was all done in after effects on like a computer borrowed from like the school at the time and like uh yeah it wasn't it really wasn't that complicated i mean it was it was kind of just a, a little bit of like like voodoo i guess you could say of just like when to when to switch screen recordings of like and how to how it was edited but uh all the windows were using like the same sort of 
uh, comp composition structure, like an After Effects, and just yeah. switching out, to, like plugging and playing other videos. Um, well, you're yeah. blowing my mind a little bit by saying you did this in a weekend only because all of the imagery in it seems extraordinarily well chosen. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, did you sleep during the weekend? Did you did it? <laughs> like, did well, you... I'll say I spent maybe about, so like, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say that the film came about from like, I, I was in a class at, at the time and uh, we it, it was like, the lockdown had pretty much just happened and we were, we were kind of being prodded to keep making work and it was and I, I i would say that the general like vibe was that that was impossible <laughs> at the time and just not uh conducive to like mental health but um so no I, I was trying to make something that would make that just would make me happy and uh, which is not normally how i work but uh, this this was like kind of a special case for that and so i i, I in order to do that i, I was like trying to think about things that make me happy and things that like like I, I feel like everyone has had those things that like if you're feeling a certain kind of way you'll like rewatch a tv show or reread a book or something like you'll, you'll revisit things a lot and yeah so that, that's like something i do all the time and so uh i just like saying the word tumblr out loud is like a little embarrassing but i still keep a tumblr and i like when i'm when I'm really sad i'll like check it or uh and like revisit old posts that I that I found to be really funny or whatever and so there, there's this one post about this candle from like 2016 or 2015 or something that I just like remembered at the time and so I was like what if I just made this into a film uh I didn't ask the author of the post just because it, it, it comes like it's also kind of interesting because it has this like air of it, it's one of the only things that like you can still kind of be anonymous on it yeah uh, but but yeah, so like the the whole piece is revolving around like my experience on Tumblr. So like all the videos, like if you're like reblogging things, you, there's a way in which you can kind of like tag your post in which if you're like in the in the future, if you want to like revisit things, you can do that really easily through your tag. Yeah. And so I just have like a tag for videos. And so I just like look through all the videos and download like almost all of them that I've been in the recent like past four years or something and okay. that, that's like how that ended up being in the video um, right. it wasn't oh. i wouldn't oh um, okay sorry did you say something <laughs> No, no, I froze up definitely here, but I was hoping that everybody else was still being able to hear what you were saying. <laughs> so, okay. like, I'm going to have to go hard, like wire this computer in like the <laughs> second one of these later. So, um, I don't know, that's a, kind of a perfect chance to sort of open everything up and allow you guys to talk to each other uh, about your work. So um, let's, uh, you know, maybe spend about 10 minutes or so doing that before we wrap up the wrap up the call anybody can go first there this is madness it's anarchy just throw off your mute and start start questioning each other i i actually just had a quick since we just came off jordan's uh jordan how, and maybe this was just raw courage in your part but how did you handle the legals for uh for your film because i you, you know all the clips in there every every time one came up i was like oh my god i can't believe he, you know we just threw it in but i mean did you did you legal anything or did you just you know damn the torpedoes it uh i did not think for a second that anyone <laughs> would want to program this film so i didn't <laughs> i didn't attempt anything at all i don't have a bibliography i don't know where anything came from so i didn't <laughs> try at all uh I will tell you right now that we none of us believed that he cleared any of it, <laughs> like when we, and we still played it. <laughs> Excellent, thank, thank you. We did see a film um, previous from an alumni and who's sent us lots of stuff for the years that has a really long segment of like oh, like a minute and a half of something in it, and we thought this is sketchier to like program <laughs> because this is a really significant portion of this but uh <laughs> you're, uh, you're to, to be fair though jordan your opening scene is is a, a little longer than comfort might dictate <laughs> right, right. a full 30 seconds yeah <laughs> so 
If you're listening out there, filmmakers, you should clear the rights. Dear. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I, I like to legally have to say that, right? <laughs> Please clear the rights to your footage and your music. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, Shan. I'm Shan. I have a question for Edgar. So, so we know each other, but I'm I'm interested. So, from the first first shot to the second one, just the from the fo photograph to the installation, they're just so it's really touching for me, and I'm I'm not sure why. And I I just want to know how you um, advance from the photograph to you want to make something in the physical space in real life to to mimic or to represent. The photograph in in the current time yeah that's my question yeah yeah i um yeah it was almost the the second part was probably the first thing that i thought about shooting because i wanted to sort of investigate how it, it, I, I think memory is more a recreation than an actual reliving of the events right so for me, I wanted to really sort of physically manifest that recreation that is obviously incomplete. Um, you know, like uh, I think a lot of the times uh, when we work with memory, we we in our films we want to be as accurate as possible. But I, I kind of like to take the opposite approach. I want to be as inaccurate or not inaccurate, but uh, acknowledge the incompleteness of it. Um, and in that way, allow for uh, the audience or the spectator to actually uh, fill in the gaps of that memory uh, with their own experience. You know, uh, I have seen people catch on really quickly that the colors on the screens are the colors of the stained glass. And some people don't know at all, but they still think that the colors manifest some kind of emotion that they were feeling when they were watching it. And, you know, I mean, it always feels kind of a cop out to say like, oh, the film means anything to you or something like that. But I, I don't, I don't mean it in that sense. I mean it more, you know, in, in that shot, the, the length of the shot and sort of the, the space and, and the silence that is occupied. By, by knowing or I hope to fill in that space, right? To sort of live in that moment, to live in that, in that, in that, in that place. I also liked that I had this photograph that didn't have people in it as a, in, in their family photo album. It's like, I was going through all of them during the quarantine and almost all of them is the same picture throughout time, you know, yeah. the family members together. And then we had this one photograph that is just the window and it's such a specific um place that i i cannot go back to right so i um wanted to 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 acknowledge that like in in a in a in a photograph without people you actually sort of inhabit it more than one with people you're sort of immediately outside of it i, I just want to mention like how different those windows are uh, with our like uh, modern architecture, it's just so shocking, and also the the sunlight of that photograph, and also the screen light that we experience every day now, it just yeah. made a big contrast. That I I think it's very interesting. Yeah, I think those the kind of like, and and those windows weren't particularly um, ornate, you know, like the stained glass is very simple; it's just two colors. But I think compared to a lot of like sort of the apartment buildings that I have lived in in the United States, or you, you don't find that kind of like space. Um, so I wanted to then, you know, approximate it by the use of digital screens, which is uh, sort of our, our own windows into looking outside, especially during quarantine. I was just so aware of how much time I was spending in front of screens. So I kind of wanted to to acknowledge that and sort of maybe uh, turn it into something else, a, a way of, a different way of using those screens. Awesome.
Well, anybody uh, with any other other questions? I have a question for Helena. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think for me, it struck me. Your film really struck me as very. Um, I mean, it might be kind of obvious, but it's just very literary. It's. Um, it felt really close to uh, like reading a short story, a very, like a very modern short story. And, uh, you know, I haven't seen your other work, but I have seen some excerpts of the purple video. And, uh, you know, you, you work a lot with text and I just kind of wanted to sort of like hear your thoughts about employing text in moving image and using it as your main source um, beyond, you know, like, uh just the pure aesthetics of it like uh you know the decision of making it your your fur your main element what i like about text i think is that the images are open or everybody can create their own image and that's the main thing i think i like especially about it if it's in film, I mean, it's also if we read a book, I guess, right? We kind of like we read and then we make up all this, each one their own. And so that's kind of why I like the combination, especially about moving text, I guess. Yeah. I think especially, in a way, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, especially also if it's about a scene which is kind of difficult to talk about maybe or to show or where you want to, like with the purple video, it seemed like perfect to just have the text which is very fast and then disappears. And I like what you said about the memory because I also feel we recreate memory. And in the purple video, it was more about like trying to go back and remember, but you never really know, or I never really knew is, you know, there are different versions of how we remember things. And um, yeah, so far. Yeah, Shen. I also have a question for Helen. Now, um, I'm interested to know how do you think about the color that you use for the text and the yeah. background, and also like purple video. I haven't seen it, but this purple is very important, obviously, and how you choose them, and also the font because it's very visual. And yeah, I just want to learn more about them. I think it's somehow associative connected to the content so with the purple i felt it's a color of empowerment and also the color of the sky if you dream and you look at the night sky like the sunset and the lucid for the lucid dreams i felt the yellow is so it's so bright yeah it's almost too much you almost can't really read it the white font on the bright backdrop that's why i kind of thought it's a perfect color for the lucid dreaming yeah. and uh, yeah the font i usually i choose it that it's kind of easy to read but it's also connected to the content for the yeah for the lucid dreams i chose a like a little bit computer like like HT, you know like a like a html text a little bit kind of font which looks a bit digital kind of like because the content is so much about text messages and Twitter even, so yeah. This is gonna be my moment to defend going to the movies to see movies and not watching them at home on, on Eventive and Zooms and whatever you're doing, uh, which I know if you're watching this Q&A that you have just watched these movies on Eventive and there's nothing in shame in that. But Helena is two movies scream to be watched on a 60 foot wide movie theater screen. Um, one, it makes the purple video readable. Uh, it's very difficult to the degree. It's very difficult to read the purple video on your computer because it's moving so quickly. Um, but also we had a very long discussion, Lena, about the background color of this movie in relation to the font. Uh, whether people would be able to read it uh, as easily as, you know. So I, one of the things that I, I think is really interesting about both of your works is that you have totally different delivery methods for the, for the text in these two films. Both of them though require, as I mentioned originally, active engagement 
on part of the audience. It is not just simply there for you to read at your own leisure. You must make an effort to do it. Um, and I think that's an important thing. And also why I can't recommend enough. Uh, this is the closing shorts program of this entire film festival. There is lots of time if you're watching this probably to come see it again. <laughs> so well, thank you for that. Um, I guess that's probably a good chance to wrap up, but I, I'm just very excited to have Helena on here because this is the second program we get to program in a year in, in a row and we did get to see each other last year. Thanks so much. I'm so happy about it. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for coming on. Uh, I want to thank the audience. Remember, uh, you know, if you love this program, if you know anybody who is interested in pushing the boundaries of what is happening in cinema today and expanding on the art of movies. We talk so much about film as art. And to me, the Sunsots program is exactly that. So please follow these artists, continue to support their work. Please continue to come out and see the movies. I hope you're having a wonderful time. Everybody stay safe out there. And thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Tim. Thanks.